Well, we've been talking about kingdom living for the past few weeks. Uh, if you have read through the Gospel of Matthew, you've probably noticed that Jesus talks an awful lot about the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. I think it's about 55 times in the Gospel of Matthew, 126 times in all of the Gospels that Jesus talks about this kingdom. And he tells all kinds of parables and he gives all kinds of illustrations to help us understand what the kingdom of God is like. And, of course, Jesus isn't talking about a physical kingdom. You know, it's not talking about something with, with physical borders and a, and a castle and armies or things like that. This is a different kind of kingdom. Actually, when Jesus was on trial before the Roman governor Pilate, uh, Pilate asked him, he says, are you a king? And then Peter, or, and then Jesus responds in John uh, 18, 36. Jesus answered, my kingdom is not an earthly kingdom. If it were, my followers would fight to keep me from being handed over to the Jewish leaders. But my kingdom is not of this world. So Jesus was saying that his kingdom was very different from the kingdom of Rome or, or any other kingdom that we might be familiar with. See, unlike most kingdoms, the kingdom of God is not centered around like a, a physical location, like a, a city or a country or a, a castle or something like that. But the kingdom of God is centered around God. Of course, and God being uh, omnipresent, he's, he's present everywhere all the time. You know, he doesn't have, he's not limited to a physical location. And so the kingdom of God is not limited to a, a physical location, but it's defined by the people who follow and carry out God's will. Two weeks ago, we looked at the Lord's Prayer, and there's a, a familiar part of that uh, prayer that, you're, that you'd remember of the old King James Version probably which goes, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And we talked about how when we pray that, we're inviting God's will as king to be done on earth, in our lives, in our community, just as God's will is being carried out in heaven right now. And so when Jesus is talking about the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven, he's talking about the people who submit to and carry out the will of our heavenly father. And that kind of makes sense that we should pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Because as we've talked about a couple of weeks before that, uh, that God's will is good and perfect and pleasing. We read in Romans uh, chapter 12, verse 2, it says, Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. See, our will is very often flawed. Uh, I, I can't speak for you, but I know my will is often selfish. And, and I make decisions that end up hurting others uh, and hurting myself. Right? We're not perfect people. We don't make perfect decisions. But God is perfect, and his will is perfect. And it's good, and it's pleasing. We don't always understand it. We don't always see the good in everything that God wills. Uh, but if we believe that the Bible describes, or if we believe how the Bible describes God, God as being uh, loving and just and, and faithful and all those things, well, then we can trust that his will actually is good and pleasing and perfect. And I've certainly seen that to be true in my life. You know, I've made a, I've had a lot of regrets about the decisions that I've made according to my will, but I've never had regrets when I've done things according to God's will. And not, not to say that it's been easy either. You know, doing things God's way often means doing the exact opposite of what everybody else is doing. Uh, we talked about how the kingdom of God is very different from the kingdom of this world. In fact, that's probably why Jesus talked about it so often, because it's so very different. If we're going to live in the kingdom of God, then we'd better be prepared to live very differently, differently from how we used to live and differently from how everyone else in the world lives. And so that's kind of what we've been talking about over these past few weeks uh, as we've been going through this message series, which we've titled Kingdom Living. You know, what is God's will for us in how we should live? You know, if Jesus is our king and if his will is good and pleasing and perfect, well, it makes sense that we'd want to see his kingdom come. We'd want to see uh, his will being done on earth, in our lives, in our families, in our community, just as his will is being done in heaven. And if that's the case, well, then what is it? What is God's good and pleasing, perfect will for our lives? How does he want us to live? Uh, what is it like to, to live in the kingdom of God? What does this, this kingdom living look like? Well, thankfully, the Bible's made most of that pretty clear for us, actually. Uh, you don't have to hold a, a theology degree to have a pretty good idea of how God wants us to live. You know, we, we know that God wants us to, to love one another. He knows that he wants us uh, to 
to be uh, caring for those in need, uh, to be honest, to be faithful to our spouse, to, to strive for justice to be done, uh, to be humble, to be, you know, all those things that, that God's laid out in the scriptures. And actually, these aren't, these aren't hidden, obscure, secret things that you have to discover in some little corner of the Bible. These are actually, you know, the, the very principles on which Western civilization, civilization was founded upon. But as our culture drifts further and further from those founding biblical principles, it's become more and more important for us to go back to the Bible and say, hey, this is how God wants us to live. This is his good and pleasing and perfect will for our lives. Uh, And and as we do that, we're going to find more and more that kingdom living is very different from worldly living. And so that's kind of been the plan for these next few weeks. We want to look at some of the principles that God has laid out for us in his Bible uh, for how we are to live. And again, I'm not really aiming for, you know, those, those obvious ones, like uh, some of the ones that I've mentioned before, these founding principles of Western civilization, although we're finding that even those obvious things are being uh, left out of our society more and more. But that's uh, another issue. Uh, for this series, anyways, I want to look at some of the things that even as long-time Christians that maybe we've already started to forget. Uh, I mentioned, I think, in one of my earlier messages that these are things that even I, I know a a pastor, have recognized, yeah, these are some things that I've been missing out in my life, things I've neglected, things I need to work on if I want to live my life in line with what God has, uh, what he said is his will for my life. And I recognize that the smells of brunch are soon going to be distracting you and the fans are going away. So I'm just going to take a quick look at one of those principles today. So to find our first principle, I want us to look in the book of Acts. Now in Acts chapter 2, we actually get kind of the first snapshot of the early church. Uh, This is just a a short time after Jesus' death and resurrection and his ascension into heaven. The Holy Spirit has just come upon that first group of believers, and they are learning for the very first time to learning how to live in the kingdom of God. And so in Acts chapter 2, we find a summary uh, of how the Bible kind of describes that first group. So this is Acts chapter 2, starting at verse 42. It says, All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. A deep sense of awe came over them all, and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. And all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. They worshipped together at the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper, and shared their meals with great joy and generosity, all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And each day, the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. Now, there's a lot that could be said about this passage here today, but I just want to make one clarification and one observation, all right? So first of all, the clarification. I don't want you to read this as a description of the ideal church, all right? The early church was not a perfect church. And what we read here, that's not the blueprints for a perfect church, uh, this passage isn't intended as a, here's what they did, so here's what you need to do. All right, so you can, you can breathe a little sigh of relief that I'm not going to ask you to sell all your possessions and give the money to the poor. Uh, we don't have to meet here every single day of the week and, and do our, our services every single day. This is just a description of what happened. This is what they did. Um, and, and, and again, I guess having said that, I think there's a lot of things that they did right. You know, a lot of the things that they did line up really well with what uh, God has laid out in other parts of the Bible of how we should live. This is what kingdom living looks like. Uh, and so that kind of brings me to my one observation. Uh, as I said, there's lots of good stuff in here, but I can't help but notice how communal their life was. This, this group of believers seemed to do everything together, right? They, 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 uh, they uh, well, let me see where it says here. They ate together. They worshiped together, uh, they shared their homes, they shared their meals, they shared their wealth. You know, everything about their life and their faith seemed to be a, a shared experience. And I don't know if you noticed that as I read through, but let me, let me read through it again. And I want you to watch for how communal this life and their faith was. It says, all the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. A deep sense of awe came over them all, and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. And all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. 
They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. They worshipped together at the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper, and shared their meals with great joy and generosity, all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And each day, the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. You know, four times in this passage, we see the word shared or sharing, right? These guys were serious about living life together. You know, this communal kind of life is a pretty stark contrast to our North American culture today, uh, I think. Uh, We are completely an individualistic society, almost to the extreme, right? We we promote self-expression and and self-fulfillment and self-identity. You know, we are so wrapped up in ourselves that actually the, the Oxford English Dictionary, word of the year in 2013 was selfie. That was the word. Selfie, that's the word of the year. And that's a a reflection of our society, absolutely. Uh, It said in uh, in 2016, we took 93 million selfies each day. (laughs) 93 million selfies each day. That's about 33 billion selfies. There's not even 8 billion people in the world. We're taking 33 billion selfies each year. And that was two years ago. I imagine that's probably amped up a little bit since then. Our obsession with self is having a profound impact on our society today. You know, many, if not all, of the moral issues that we're wrestling with right now stems from this obsession with self. Things like, you know, from abortion to euthanasia to our our gender issues, uh, parental rights in school, even the legalization of marijuana, that all stems from a me-centered, individualistic society. The question is always, what's best for me? It's never, what's best for us, is it? You know, we are a a me-centered society, and that's uh, finding its way even into the church. We're we're not immune from that. I read an article this week by a guy named Joseph Hellerman, and he wrote a book called When the Church Was Family. And, And I just want to share a little snippet from what he wrote. He said, We are a radically individualistic society oriented towards personal fulfillment in ways profoundly more me-centered than any other culture or people group in world history. It is our individualism, our insistence that the rights and satisfaction of the individual must take priority over any group to which one belongs that has seriously compromised our ability to stay in relationship and grow with one another as God intends. You know, and I think that is so true. You know, when we insist that our rights and our satisfaction take priority over our family, over our church, over our community, you know, that seriously compromises our ability to stay in relationship and to grow as God intended. I think one of the the hallmarks of Christianity, you know, one of the most distinct characteristics of God himself is self-sacrificing love, isn't it? No, it's putting others before ourselves. Jesus said to his disciples in John 13, 34, he says, just as I have loved you, you should love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. In other words, what Jesus is saying here is that one of the ways that the kingdom of God is radically different from the kingdom of this world is that in the kingdom of God, we live for the good of others. We sacrifice for someone else's benefit. We give up our rights and our privileges for the sake of someone else. You know, that's certainly what Jesus did, right? And that's really what love is. You know, I think today being Mother's Day is a a great reminder and a great example of that. Uh, Mothers are prime examples of living for someone else's good, of sacrificing for someone else's benefits, of giving up their rights and their privileges for someone else's good. Mothers do that all the time. You know, that they give up sleep. For their, their kids. They, they give up incredible amounts of time. Uh, they, many of them sacrifice their, their career and their personal ambitions to raise their kids. They wade through mountains of laundry. They, they wash dishes and, and they change dirty diapers. You know, and I recognize that some dads do that as well, and that's good, but it's Mother's Day. So today uh, we'll focus on the mothers. But why do they do all that? You know, that's easy because they love. Their families. You know, when you love someone, you live for their good. 
You give up your rights and your privileges for their sake. When you love someone, you want them to to flourish and and to prosper and just to have every possible advantage. That's why moms willingly sacrifice so much. They want what's best for their kids. And it's God's good and pleasing and perfect will that all of us show that same kind of love uh, for others as well. People should be able to tell. Oh, there flips our breaker. (laughs) Coffee. Does it every time. (laughs) I'll speak loudly. If I can find my spot now. Yeah, it's God's good and pleasing and perfect will for us that we show that same kind of love for others. People should be able to tell that we are His followers, that we live in the kingdom of God by the fact that we have this self-sacrificing love for one another. Almost almost a mother-like love for each other, which is kind of weird and strange. But again, that's how the kingdom of God works. And this is exactly what Jesus demonstrated for all of us. You know, it wasn't for Jesus' benefit that he came to the earth as a man. It wasn't to his advantage to be arrested and to be beaten and to be mocked and to be whipped and to be put on that cross. You know, it didn't help him out to be put on that cross and to die an excruciating death. He did that for our sake. He willingly sacrificed for our good. That's the example that he's given to us. Paul writes in uh, Philippians 2, uh, starting at verse 3, Paul says, Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. Don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, He gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on the cross. Therefore, God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus has given us the greatest example of self-sacrificing love. And Paul says that as his followers, as those who live in the kingdom of God, we're to have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. And I like how the, the NET translates those first three verses in that passage I, I read for you. I'll read it again in the NET. It says, Instead of being motivated by selfish ambition or vanity, each of you should, in humility, another as more important than yourselves. Each of you should be concerned not only about your own interests, but about the interests of others as well. You should have the same attitude towards one another that Christ Jesus had. And you know, that's, that's a big ask. You know, in our individualistic, self-centered society, it's hard to give up our rights and the things that we're entitled to in order to put others first. It's hard to put the needs and the desires of others ahead of our own. Now granted, mothers do a pretty good job of that when it comes to raising their kids. But God calls each of us to do that, and not just to our kids, but to each other. Why, that's why when we read in that Acts passage about these guys who are, who are selling their possessions and they're <coughs> sharing the money with those in need, you know, that sounds pretty crazy in the kingdom of this world, but you know, that actually kind of makes sense in the kingdom of God. You know, think back to when you were growing up. If by chance you went through a time when your family was, was down on their luck and money was scarce and, and there wasn't enough food on the table for the kids, wouldn't your mom sell some of her stuff? I mean, she's got some things. Wouldn't she sell that stuff to provide food for her kids? Well, absolutely. That's, that's a no-brainer. Of course she would. It, it, we almost expect her to do that. And, and it's because moms love their kids. You, you wouldn't imagine a loving mom hoarding her own stuff and not sharing with her kids. That's the same reason why these guys in Acts did that thing, why they sold their stuff. They had a, a self sacrificing love for their family of God. You know, it was a no-brainer for them to sell some of their stuff to provide for these other fellow Christians who were down on their luck that needed some help. It wasn't because they were told to, because the, the, you know, the pastor preached to them and said, you should do this. No, they just loved those guys, and they wanted to serve them in that way. You know, I think this morning I'd, I'd encourage you to have that same attitude that those guys in Acts had, the same attitude uh, that 
your moms have, the same attitude that Christ Jesus had, and, and have that self-sacrificing love for the, the people of God, for the people around you, uh, to, to give up your, your rights, your privileges, your, your things that you're entitled to for the good of others. And I know that that kind of sounds a little bit backwards. You might even think, well, you know, I can't do that. I can't take care of everybody, right? I, I don't have unlimited resources. If I'm constantly giving, eventually, I'm going to run out. I'm going to burn out, right? Who's going to take care of me? And certainly, if we were living in the kingdom of the world, that would be a, a legitimate concern. But here's the good news. In the kingdom of God, we have a limitless king who has unlimited resources. And he loves us with an, uh, an unending love. We don't have to worry about running out or, or burning out. Paul tells us in Philippians 4, verse 19, he says, And my God will supply your every need according to His glorious riches in Christ Jesus. You know, when we understand who our King is and how much He loves us, we never have to be concerned uh, about who's going to take care of us. We already know that. We know who's going to take care of us. We can be absolutely free to give generously, to love lavishly, and to serve sacrificially, knowing that our God will supply our every need uh, through Jesus Christ. In the kingdom of God, we're free to put others ahead of ourselves because we know we're already taken care of. And of course, this goes way beyond our physical resources. I know our minds immediately go to that. We think about money and stuff. But this goes way beyond that. That's, that's part of it. But there's more. When we're living like this in the kingdom of God, that impacts every part of our life. You know, moms don't just sacrifice money and stuff for their kids. Uh, they do all kinds of things out of love. Uh, time, I think, is one of the biggest ones. How many times does a mom's day get interrupted to put on a Band-Aid or, or to admire some crayon artwork or, or to drive to dance or take them to soccer practice or whatever it is? I mean, moms are constantly interrupted every day, all day. And that's how it works in the kingdom of God, too. You know, we should be willingly allowing these interruptions to come into our day and into our plans so that we can serve one another. You know, maybe we, we give up our golf plans to go help a, a buddy move. Or, or maybe we, we miss that hockey game so we can be part of a, a town event. Or maybe we, we skip out sleeping in on Sunday mornings to come and worship and fellowship together. Uh, my parents were absolutely committed to our local church family. We attended church every single morning and every single evening and every single Wednesday night prayer meeting and every, you know, the list goes on and on and on. And as a kid, I didn't always appreciate that. You know, there were times when church was not very exciting and you're probably familiar with that. But I came to learn later that they didn't do that for their benefit. They didn't do it because we had such amazing services. They did that for the sake of the other people that were at church. They went there to serve and to encourage and to support all the others that would gather in the family of God. And I found that's such a, a great example of kingdom living, of that self-sacrificing love that they illustrated for me. And I'm so glad to see that very thing in so many of you guys in our church too. You guys faithfully come week after week after week. And I know it's not because our services are so great, because they're not. I know it's not because you have nothing better to do, because I know that you do. So why do you do it? Well, you do it because you love this church family. Uh, you come and you serve in, in the, the Sunday school, in, in the nursery, uh, you, you bring snacks for the back, you help out at our kids club, you generously give your hard-earned money uh, to the church and, and to missionaries, and you, you serve breakfast to a whole bunch of hungry moms over there. You know, I'm blown away by the fact that uh, it's Mother's Day today, and Sherry, she's a mother herself, and yet she's volunteered to work away in that kitchen making brunch for all of us. What a mom, right? What a, a great example of self-sacrificing love. What a great example of kingdom living. Uh, and so as you guys go home this afternoon after we've wrapped up our brunch and you go into your week, you're going to be immersed once again in, in the center of this me-centered <coughs> society. And I would just encourage you to remember that you have an unlimited king who loves you more than you can imagine. And he will happily supply your every need according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus, leaving you completely free to mimic those guys in Acts, to, to mimic 
your mom, to mimic so many in our church, to mimic our Lord Jesus Christ himself, and willingly, uh, even excitedly, uh, love one another lavishly, give generously, serve uh, self-sacrificingly, uh, out of love for one another. I'm going to invite the, the music team to come up, and we're going to sing one last song. I'm just going to close in a word of prayer. Oh, I guess we have no power, so... Well, that still works. Can we, can we pull it off with what we have? Just a guitar? Yeah. Sure, we can do just a guitar. Oh, we've got the bongs in. I'll wow. sing with you. Whatever. Let's do that. We can do it together. And then we'll give it, a, give it our best shot. See, we don't come for our great services. <laughs> <laughs> but let's pray together, and then we'll sing that song through together. Dear God, thanks again so much for your incredible love for us. You are absolutely our example, our go-to uh, person for how to learn how to live self-sacrificingly, if that's a word. Thanks for your incredible love for us. You didn't hold anything back. You just gave it all for us, for our sake, for our benefit. God, I pray that we would be able to mimic you in doing that uh, in our families, in our communities, uh, in our uh, marriage relationships, uh, in our society. Help us learn how to love like you do. Thanks so much for your incredible love for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.